Hello everyone. My name is Amol from Open Networking Foundation and I, I will serve as a moderator today. This meeting is being recorded and will be made available afterwards. Thank you for joining this first Aether community meeting. We appreciate your interest in learning more about ONF's Aether Private 5G and Edge platform. This meeting will enable Aether users to share their experience, knowledge, lesson learned, and deploying and using Aether. In each meeting, we will feature an Aether user who will share their story about how they are using it and their experiences. For the first meeting, we will provide an overview of Ether and its architecture, followed by our guest speaker from Sabon University, who will discuss their SLICE project and how they are using Ether. The final session will be community roundtable, offering anyone a chance to participate. All participants have been placed on a mute during the presentation. If you would like to ask a question, please use Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and type your question. Following each speaker, we will conduct a short Q&A session. For the community roundtable, please write your question in the chat window. I will read your question and unmute you. Those who want to comment or reply to that question, please raise your hand and I will unmute you so you can reply or make a comment on that question. Here our first presenters are Ajay and Shiva. Ajay, please uh, say hello to the community. Ajay is a technical leader of the SD Core project. SD Core is ONF's private 4G, 5G connectivity solution. He is also a TST member of the SD Core, SD RAN, and the Ether project. Shiva, please uh, say hello to the community. Good morning, everybody. Shiva is the new head of the engineering for the ONF. Shiva has an extensive background in mobile networking and security from companies such as Ericsson, Juniper, and Cisco. Ajay, please go ahead and share your screen. As a reminder, if you would like to ask a question, please type it into Q&A and we will visit those after they finish their talk. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you for attending today's call. I'll just go over a quick overview of Ether that will help the new community members. So I have just two slides from my side, so I'll keep it uh, very short. So this is how typically we see how Ether gets deployed. We have uh, Ether central control plane, which is deployed in the cloud and one or more connected edges, Ether connected edges, we call it as an ACE at the multiple locations. Uh, if you see Ether central cloud, it has three building blocks. First one is Ether connectivity control. This is our 3GPP compliant 4G and 5G core network stack. The second block is a Ether management platform. We call it AMP. This is a set of uh, collect, uh, tools used by our operations team to manage Ether-like network. And you can host uh, your IoT or AIML or any enterprise apps at the Ether Central Cloud as well. On the other hand, uh, AMP, uh, let me just give you more idea about what exactly is the uh, tools we use as a part of Ether management platform. Uh, first set of tool includes the provisioning, hardware provisioning tools. Then we have the tools related to CI and CD, which includes fleet, then Docker registry, and then Rancher and Jenkins. Then we have a ROC as a part of AMP. ROC is used as a ROC is in the run, nothing but runtime operation control. And we use it to co configure the various Ether subcomponents. AMP also has a tools related to monitoring the performance of the Ether, uh, like Prometheus and Grafana. It all, we also deploy some of the tools to do monitor the logging and performance of the Ether, uh, like uh, we deploy ELK stack, Fluentd, and, and Kibana. 
So these all tools are used to monitor the, the activities of the operations in the network. Right? And that helps into the making sure that Ether remains up for most of the time. Right? On the other hand, now Ether Connected Edge, it, it consists of a set of compute nodes and then SDN fabric switch. Then it has the SD core component of it, which is user plane component, and it has SD RAN as well. You can have one or more small cells uh, connected to uh, Ether Edge. Uh, any small cell should work as long as it's a 3GPP compliant. If, if small cell is disaggregated, that's better because then you can make use of uh, SDRAN capabilities. About the software component, so all the software provided by Ether comes as a containerized and we use Kubernetes as the container orchestration platform. And we have say, shown here a set of devices type which uh, enterprise can connect to uh, like, uh, and, and we have the ability to group them so that you can give a different treatment for every type of device. Right? So that, that comes under the network slicing. Now, previously we saw the how typically Ether looks like from the deployment point of view. Now this slide gives us the view around how it maps all those component maps to the Ether projects. We make use of four uh, building blocks in the Ether and all of these four projects uh, are part of the uh, Open Networking Foundation. First one is the SD core, which has a two component. One component sits in the central cloud and other component sits at the Ether edge. This is SD core supports 4G, 5G and 5G NSA. Uh, and SD core at the edge is uh, UPF. It, we, we support two UPF, one is like software-based base UPF and one is a hardware-based P4 UPF. Uh, SDRAN is our uh, ORAN compliant near real-time uh, RIC controller, RIC based on the Micronos architecture. SDRAN comes up with the set of, uh, uh, it, it comes with the SDKs, which you can use to develop your applications. You can find some of the ONF's uh, sample XFs and you're encouraged to look at it. And I'm, I'm sure you will come up with the many more new ideas about the XFs, right? SDRAN project is integrated with the disaggregated RAN in the DT trial. We had demonstrated a, a working solution on this on the SDRAN RIC with the, I, I guess, four vendors. It includes a, a radio unit from the different company, then DU and CU from the different company, software stack from the different company, and core was from the ONF side. SD Fabric is a SDN programmable forwarding plane. SD Fabric has a UP4 app, which realizes the P4 UPF portion which we call it as a hardware-based UPF, which can be used for the very high performance. Now, coming back to the, the most uh, important component, which is the uh, uh, ROC, which is runtime operational control. We use runtime operational control to manage all these components, to configure them, and during runtime to change their behavior. Some of the very basic use case we can uh, think about is that creating the network slices or modifying or deleting the network slices in the network. So that you can do from the Ether. As well as you can configure the QoS within the SD core, and then SD core configures the user pen function, right? So QoS is also one of the main aspect which gets control from the Ether. You can, manages, uh, you can manage the various devices assigned to the slices. You can manage the various applications assigned to slices. So runtime operation control is really a model which we expect it will grow and it will control more and more functionality of the Ether aspect. And it's, you, you can imagine that there's so many software components, it's very hard to go and update each and every software component independently. So this is a, this gives you a single view of all the management of the Ether. We do support QoS at the three levels. Very high level, we have the QoS support at the slice level. And the second is that we have supported the UE level QoS support. And third is that we have per application QoS support. So all these three level of QoS support really helps into getting the different, different use cases in the enterprises. Um, 
yeah, I think that's all I wanted to cover. I'll, I'll pass it to uh, Siva to take us more through how we plan to use Ether. Over Thank you, AJ. That was a that was a, a fabulous introduction. Um, what I want to cover is is how people are using Ether and the what we call the consumption models. And I'll, I'll sort of move from from the very most the most straightforward model we have. We call Ether in a box, and it's Ether installed on a single machine, either with a, a single physical radio or a simulated RAN. Um, allowing you to essentially put an entire network on a box. I literally installed this on an old MacBook Pro. Uh, took me, you know, less than half a day to get it going, and I've got uh, I've got a, a 4G radio. Uh, AJ just uh, just started installation on a 5G radio, so we're able to put together this this type of a setup um, very very quickly, very easily. And it's ideal for evaluating Ether, learning cloud platform, some of the tools that are used uh, for research on the on the cloud platform, and uh, and in some cases research around the programmable SD fabric. But this is really meant as a as a starting point to be able to learn uh, learn how to deploy, learn concepts. It, but it can also be used as a, as a powerful tool to extend the uh, the functionality, uh, build upon the APIs that exist within uh, within Ether. Um, on the next slide, AJ. Yeah. Um, we we're actually going to move to a model called Ether Standalone, and this is not something we really advertised before. Um, because and because Ether has got such flexible building blocks, it allows us to do a, a wide range of different configurations. So the key cat the, the key categorization around Ether standalone is that you're deploying both the edge and the core of the mobile network within a private network. Now that can be multi-sites, that could be uh, across physical geographies, but essentially all within a single private uh, private enterprise, with connectivity to the to the internet, and in this case, you can see that the building blocks around the the edge and the core, the IoT, AI, ML platforms, edge apps, um, are all still available. Are all still easily deployed on commercially available hardware. Um, those edge components can actually be moved to the closer to the to the radio side, uh, as we showed in the previous uh, previous diagrams, so that. If you needed to do more real-time intensive, more latency sensitive type of applications, the tool sets available to allow you to essentially move building blocks around to suit the network's needs. And this is really what we see as um, the, the primary vehicle for providing 4G or 5G connectivity services built again on readily available hardware. Um, the extensible architecture lets you pay as you grow. So you can start with just, you know, an edge and core in one site um, connected to a series of uh, RAN nodes. Um, and, and that may be perfectly good for connectivity services. And then as your needs get more intense, as you define applications that require it, you can move things around. You can write applications for the Ether platform and extend the functionality to meet your unique needs. So from... From, from this perspective, you know, whether it's a smart edge uh, proof of concept trial, or even we see customers using this uh, as, a, as a commercial deployment, um, this is a very full set of capabilities. Um, hardware acceleration, as, uh, as AJ mentioned, is also capable. So you can run the user plane forwarding either in, hard, either in software on general purpose compute, or you can use hardware acceleration based on the uh, P4 model and underlying hardware to deliver incredibly fast, uh, fast performance. So again, it, it can scale and, uh, and move to your needs as you grow. Ether Cloud um, is, is really, think of this as very much the exact same model, except your mobile core is deployed in a commercial cloud provider or perhaps a, a hosted environment that you've got outside of your, outside of your private enterprise boundaries. And in the same way that the, the, the network, uh, network capabilities, network components can be reallocated, can be moved around, the same thing is true here. And you may choose to move 
the edge, uh, the ether connected edge closer to the RAN sites, allowing you to perform uh, near real time activities on the on the data plane uh, and traffic analysis through uh, AI ML pl uh, platforms and edge apps. This is also extremely popular with people who don't want to deploy the physical hardware uh, for the core in their own network and would rather rely on the likes of uh, Google Cloud, AWS and others. Um, it has the same type of, of flexibility uh, and the UPF can be extended to the RAN for edge computing. And this is really ideal for, for 4G, 5G connectivity services built where there's a readily available cloud provider infrastructure. And this, this makes it easy to get started. Uh, you know, simply sign up for your account and start, uh, start going. They provide all the compute capability. Uh, also uh, very valuable for writing applications on top of the Ether platform. So where we're taking Ether in terms of the consumption model going forward, and if you look at Ether in a box, we'll, we in ONF will continue to focus on simplification. We want this to be really easy to use, really easy to deploy. Um, we want to make sure that, that you can be up and running in a, in a short amount of time with, with very few issues uh, or no issues, and we'll continue to continue to evolve the, the rock to represent uh, the features and capabilities available. And we're going to continue to add CPU target support. For example, ARM, uh, ARM is already engaged and working with us to provide support for, for ARM-based CPUs um, and uh, broaden the appeal to, to what may be available or useful in your environment. For Ether standalone, Again, straightforward installation and upgrade to higher capacity, higher reliability. Um, we want to cultivate additional UPF accelerators. So as other companies see that there is a value here in, in providing hardware acceleration, we're going to work with those types of vendors to give a, a, a broader range of choice in terms of how would you like to have acceleration, what acceleration is useful and valuable. We also want to see that um, we get more co complex and bespoke configurations and mix and match UPF. And, and the key message here is that in all of these configurations, the community has to be an integral part of the overall ecosystem. And we're not going to be able to do everybody's, uh, everybody's uh, configurations, everybody's unique um, setups. So we'll look to the community to, to be saying, okay, well, we tried doing it this way. And here's the feedback. It worked well, or perhaps there were issues that we need to go and address. Similarly with Ether Cloud, uh, customizable installation for cloud. So we've currently got uh, GCP supported, um, but as, as people want to move to other cloud vendors, we'll look to the community and say, hey, look, we want to use, G we want to use Azure, for example. Um, security enhancements like VPN between the cloud and the edge. Um, that's an area of, of complexity that not everybody needs to tackle. We'll look to the community to help provide leadership, guidance, uh, and, and ultimately software into the open source that helps, uh, that helps the overall community benefit from the deployment of Ether and the use of Ether around the, uh, around the globe. Um, rather than going into lots and lots of um, descriptions, um, there's a set of resources here for documentation. Uh, the Slack channel to communicate with both ONF and other members of the community, uh, the technical steering team um, with what's going on, what's happening in terms of the, the code management, the releases, and the community meeting notes where you can see information about what others are doing as well as, uh, as, well as ONF. Obviously, this will be available to you in the, uh, in the slide package. And the last, uh, last slide is, is really just a quick overview of, uh, of the, the many, many uh, deployments we have around the globe, people who are actively deploying uh, Ether, actively doing research, actively extending Ether's capabilities. Uh, I'm, in, uh, I'm in Ottawa today, and I met with the University of Ottawa earlier in the week. I'll talk to Carleton University uh, later in the week and, uh, and uh, a, number of, uh, a number of other organizations uh, here in the uh, here in uh, Canada's capital, uh, but it is a it is a global uh, global use, user base and a, a global community, and uh, we're looking forward to having many many more people join and extend the uh, extend the capabilities of Ether. 
Uh, thank you. I'll uh, I'll leave it at that and 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 transition to the uh, the presentation from uh, Sorbonne University. Thank you, Ajay and Shiva, for this nice presentation. I see there are a couple of questions uh, that I can go through. First question from Robert: What release is currently? We have the four G release thirty plant and five G release fifteen compliant. And we have planned to up upgrade the 5G release. We, we don't plan to upgrade the 4G release, but we will upgrade the 5G release. And as well as we will upgrade the N4 interface for both 4G as well as 5G. Thank you, Ajay. The next question is from Aman. Uh, which 5G, 3GPP release is supported, R15 or R16? Yeah, I think I, I just answered that. And the uh, second question was, is N3? IWF supported. So we have primarily focused on the uh, 3GPP access, which is the small cell based access, and we have not really worked on the non 3GPP access, which can be the Wi Fi can be used to access the core network, right? We have not worked on that as of today. But it should be fairly easy that since the interfaces are compliant, if you want to use the rest of the Ether components and bring in your own N3 IWF, that should be possible. Okay, thank you, Ajay. Next question is from uh, Viswa. Does Ether support multi-tenancy? Uh, actually, this question is, has a lot more aspect uh, because each and every component has its own uh, ways of thinking like what multi-tenancy is, right? So we have not really tried the multi-tenancy as such, given that we uh, typically talk about the enterprises, uh, private enterprises, which is a small size and it's not the big infrastructure. So we, we say that if you have the, uh, if you want to manage the uh, different uh, set of tenant, uh, perhaps we will ask you to set up a different ether, in, ether deployment altogether, right? But it really depends on, like this is the complete isolation, right? But but you you can fair definitely use it by using the various operations tools available on the Kubernetes. But I really want to know the the precise question. I mean, what component of Ether you are looking for? But if you are looking for whole Ether, then I will say no. It's not a hundred percent capable of providing multi tenancy. But given it's lightweight, we suggest you to deploy a separate Ether instance for the different tenant. Yeah. Okay. Next question is from Kevin. Uh, are there ether on anthos or anthos or bare metal guide available yeah there are some guides we have tried the ether on the anthos only thing is some of the guides are still private we need to work on it and get rid of some of the content which is not uh, valuable for the open source community so probably we can take the action item on it and make the document public by adding the content in the ether docs website yeah. Thank you, Ajay. Next question is from Abdullah. What is the orchestrator used in the Aether? Is it ONAP, OMS, or XOS? No, I, I did not get this question. So we, we use Kubernetes and we use Rancher to deploy the Kubernetes on all the clusters. So I'm not familiar with this terminology. So definitely these are not the things which we use. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Ajay. I think there are uh, many questions uh, on the q and a part, but it's really difficult due to time constraints. We cannot cover them all. I'm really thank you to all of you to share your uh, questions with us. But uh, we have a Slack channel where, uh, where all the Ether community come together and they share their experience as well as uh, the questions. I think uh, I'm sorry that uh, we cannot cover uh, all those questions. So let's uh, let's go to the next presenter. Thank you very much for sharing uh, your questions with us. Now it's time to introduce our speaker from Sobon University to share how they are using Ether as a part of SLICE project. Sergey Fidida is a professor with Sobon University since 1995. His research interest are related to the future of internet technology and architecture. He is currently coordinating the SLICE project, which he will be talking about today. Sergey, please say hi to the community. Hello. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
Sergey will be joining today by Theodorus, who is a PhD student at Sorbonne University. Theodorus, can you say hi to the community? Hello, everyone. Okay, thank you. Please go ahead, Sergey, and share your screen. So good morning and good afternoon. And again, uh, I would like to thank the organizers for providing us with the opportunity to introduce Lysis. I will uh, just give a, a very short uh, introduction about who we are, what is our mission, and what are the potential synergies with Ether. And then I will hand over to Theodoros, who will uh, give uh, an introduction about uh, our experience. So, um, in a nutshell, uh, we are uh, dealing with uh, the development of a test platform to address uh, beyond 5G and 6G research infrastructures. And uh, of course, this is a, a challenge because uh, the technology has not been invented yet. But uh, this is also what uh, happened when we were dealing with uh, 5G and uh, before that with 4G. Of course, they are important stakeholders and we have very strong connection with them. Uh, different funding agencies in the US and you certainly are aware of some of the uh, projects. In Europe also, there is a big development now, uh, which is named uh, CG uh, Smart Network and Services and also, of course, uh, similar development in uh, mainland China. Huge competition is coming from the uh, hyperscalers because they provide a unique infrastructure for uh, developing research and uh, providing a competitive advantage with respect to producing uh, scientific papers. But we believe that there is a huge opportunity with the emergence of uh, open source uh, software communities, and this is what I'm going to talk about. So the main difference between what we are doing and what has been done in the past is, uh, is about the methodology. So if you look at the two pictures here, they are basically what we call scientific instruments. So like a collider for high energy physics discovery process or a telescope for astronomy. In the past and until now, nowhere in the world, we succeed to have, let's say, a telescope to support the research in digital sciences. What we did with SLICES is basically to move from mid-scale funding, which is what you have seen in past uh, platforms, to large-scale funding, which is basically the scale at which different organizations are supporting scientific instruments. And in Europe, there is an agency which is named S3, which is basically the place where you put your proposal in order to become a scientific instrument. It's very competitive. There is only one solicitation every four years. And we're very happy to say that SLICES succeed to enter into the roadmap of S3. So what does it mean? So as you will see, it means that we are sustainable on a long period of time, as a telescope will last certainly over 20 years. We have a very strong support. It's a joint investment strategy from the European Commission and the member states. And you can see here that we got the support of uh, 12 member states in Europe, political support and commitment, which means that today we have 25 organizations that have signed the political agreement. But of course, um, in each member state, we have one or two organizations that basically are responsible to reach out to a much broader community. So basically, certainly over 100 organization, mostly universities and uh, uh, scientific organizations. Of course, link with industry is high. So you can see here a lot of support from industry where we expect to build an infrastructure that will also serve the needs of uh, the uh, industrial environments together with uh, other stakeholders. So what is the link or the relationship between slices and uh, ether as an example? Basically, when you want to develop such a scientific instrument that is targeting beyond 5G and 6G, you have to deploy an infrastructure that is as close as possible to what you expect the final uh, deployment to be. 
And we certainly will benefit from the fact that a large part of the future infrastructure will be softwareized, and that we can certainly benefit from those important development from the open source community. So what we are planning to deploy is a fully controllable because it's a scientific instrument. So you need to be able to collect the data and understand what is happening. Programmable, of course, on virtualized digital infrastructure. It will be fully open because again, it's a scientific instrument and we plan to have it as an international community development because again, we do address scientific challenges. So we plan to address a broad set of research topics, because again, when we put the proposal, we had to demonstrate that they are very challenging scientific questions because it's science driven, but also that we have a very engaged and vibrant community behind us. So we are planning to address, uh, of course, advanced wireless networking, smart infrastructure, different type of uh, new uh, services, advanced functionalities, security, carbon footprint, as well as privacy. What is important to understand is that when you uh, pretend to develop a scientific instrument, you not only address the infrastructure, but you have to address the full research life cycle, meaning that you should collect the data that are related to experiment and make them available to the community together with the software artifact, because you expect to be able to support uh, reproducibility. Timeline, as you can see, this is the timeline of a telescope. So we already uh, started the design phase back in 2017. We are now moving from the design to the preparation phase where we are going to uh, make sure that all the components are ready for deployment but it will be a continuous deployment. And formally speaking, the implementation will start at the end of 2023 uh, and the operation uh, likewise because of this continuous deployment. So what we are doing now and the reason why we uh, are working with Ether is that uh, we are developing a reference architecture for slices, understanding that we have a very broad footprint, which again provide a unique playground for really testing, deploying, uh, 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 really uh, uh, developing different type of, uh, of components on that footprint. We already decided to use OpenAI interface. That's a very important for com component for us. And uh, we started to play with uh, Ether in order to understand how we can provide a proper articulation between the two uh, uh, framework. This will provide us with more opportunities. So what we did and what you will see in the presentation of Theodoros is that we basically uh, are, have used the uh, Ether Core plus UPF and uh, OpenAI interface, and especially with respect to disaggregated RAMs. We are highly interested in uh, the support of SD Fabric and UPF. And uh, this also uh, could be a good opportunity to experiment with different uh, radio units and especially because of the regulation uh, experiment with different uh, uh, frequency bands. Certainly, we could think about a joint strategy regarding aura. What is specific in uh, slices is uh, that you don't have in uh, the digital infrastructure is that we have to develop an experimental plane, which is what is needed to control the experiment. And of course, to provide a specific portal and API in order for the experimenters to uh, easily access the facility. So that's basically what I wanted to say about slices in a nutshell, and you can easily uh, look up the website. And uh, without delay, I would like to hand over to Theodoros uh, so that he can uh, give you an idea about what has been done with Ether. The rules, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Um, hello, uh, my name is uh, Theodoros Surdenis. Uh, I'm a joint PhD student at the Sorbonne University and University of Essily, and I will present you the experiences that we gather from deploying the Ether framework. 
Uh, during the previous months, we dealt with uh, both types of uh, deployment provided by Ether. Uh, the Ether in a box for developers was uh, our first deployment in order to get familiar with uh, SD Core and the ROC uh, uh, functions, as well as with the various other components of Ether. Uh, then since we had some cells at our disposal, we explored the deployment of uh, Ether in a box for hardware radios which uh, corresponds uh, better to, uh, to what we want to achieve in the project. Uh, so our setup is partly located at the Sorbonne University uh, for the edge infrastructure and University of SLA need to test it for the Ether con uh, connectivity control. To deploy the Ether framework, we utilize some cloud native tools the OpenStack for creating and controlling uh, virtual machines uh, will host uh, our deployment. Uh, as you know, with OpenStack, uh, we can easily scale uh, our virtual instances and have portable configurations. Um, inside these uh, virtual machines, we deployed the Ether, uh, which gives us another level of virtualization as it operates in a Kubernetes environment. In this way, we were able to manage uh, core network functions uh, as microservices. Uh, the deployment also included uh, monitoring solutions such as Grafana, Prometheus, uh, for easy and uh, comprehensive monitoring of the uh, life cycle of the Ether pods. Uh, for the hardware, uh, we used two CBRS LT Circum cells uh, for the inode B part of the architecture. These uh, cells are connected directly to the uh, bare metal servers, uh, as you can see on the figure down right. Uh, for developers' uh, deployment, the role of the inode B plays the open air interface simulator as a simulation solution for evaluating uh, the developers' commits. We also used uh, one cell phone that supports the CBRS frequencies, in which in our case was an iPhone 11 for the connectivity tests. Uh, so let's now move on to the demo of what we achieved. So here we are in a Kubernetes environment and uh, with uh, kube control command we inspect all the deployed pods of the SD core network uh, on the uh, OMEC namespace. We see that all the OMEC components are running successfully. And then we see all the necessary pods that are running for the deployment of the Ether, Ether's framework, uh, such as the cube system pods, as well as the, the pod networking uh, pods, which in our case, uh, the pod network is uh, Calico. Uh, we also see some uh, some pods for the SDN controller, which is the Honest controller, uh, that which is responsible for the user plane and quality, quality of services. And finally, we see some pods uh, that uh, are responsible for the user interface, such as the ROC graphical user interface, uh, and for monitoring, such as Prometheus and Grafana. Uh, and then we'll go to the Grafana dashboard to monitor uh, the health state of the inode B, the active uh, subscribers and the throughput over the time, as well as the current uh, traffic, uh, that it's uh, traffic between the end users and the UPF. Uh, we see that uh, our phone is successfully subscribed with uh, this IMSI. And now we'll try to do some connectivity tests. Uh, First, we switch on the LT on the iPhone. And do we see that uh, the bit, the TX bit rate increased as soon as we're connected to the network? Then to, to we do some connectivity tests with, uh, uh, send some packets to the core network. We see that uh, the packets come and go successfully. And then we will uh, explore the uh, ROC user interface, which gives us the opportunity to uh, create, a, for example, a new slice uh, or edit uh, the current one by applying quality of service uh, to the end user. Um, we also can uh, explore the D not B and D not B configurations. And of course, we can add uh, new subscribers to the network with a very easy way. 
So uh, one of our goals was to achieve connectivity with uh, multiple test beds. We tested the distributed deployment. Uh, the radio access network uh, was running at the Sorbonne University and the control core network was running at the NATO's test bed. Uh, the communication uh, between the distant servers is based on a VPN layer three link. Uh, the geographical distance between the servers has no impact on the latency of the end user as uh, the user plane core function is deployed on the edge. Uh, which is near the base station, uh, while all the control functions are deployed on the cloud. Uh, through our test, uh, we faced some problems, uh, such as uh, UPF pod readiness in some different machines of our setups. We also had some problems with the uh, packet arriving at the UPF. Uh, we had the end-to-end -end connectivity, but uh, the user data wasn't appropriate for Worded. Uh, this is a well-known issue in the community. And in some servers, we weren't able to solve these problems. Uh, we also started to experiment with the uh, SD-RAN, which by this time is compatible only with uh, OpenAir uh, interface CUDU and RAN simulators. Uh, the SD-RAN incorporates the ORAN architecture uh, as it exposes all the necessary um, uh, OpenRAN interfaces, such as the E2, uh, O1, and as well as the corresponding protocols uh, uh, such as SCTP, NetConf, etc. It also uses its own uh, recontroller, the Ionos controller, which uh, is suitable for high availability and performance and can be integrated with uh, third party XAP uh, vendors. In this way, we can experiment with uh, open run architectures and its uh, fertile ground for the development of uh, various uh, AI uh, uh, machine learning uh, XAPs. Uh, to summarize, Ether is a very good solution for private uh, 4G, 5G networks, uh, as it provides quality of service and security. It, uh, it also enables uh, federated and distributed experimentation, which is uh, consistent uh, with the objective of the Slices project. Uh, and finally, it's open and uh, programmable, which is uh, very important for researchers and academia. So this was it. We will be more than happy to answer uh, to all of your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sergey and Theodorus. Uh, I see a couple of questions. Uh, one of the questions I would like to ask uh, to any of you that how much time uh, did you uh, take to uh, bring up the ether to the service? Uh, how much time? What, what do you mean? Uh, like uh, total duration of ether deployment. Uh... It's it actually it's a the script uh, that uh, takes around uh, uh, fifteen minutes something like this twenty minutes but with uh, extra configurations of the network it might be longer so great thank you thank you for the answer is there any but I guess to was the point was how, how much time did it take for you to start with uh, the deployment until success oh okay yes. Um, it's, it actually took uh, around uh, two months uh, to explore uh, the documentation and test the deployment. So, and also uh, exchanging, uh, you know, uh, opinions and uh, communicating with uh, uh, technical support from the, uh, the Slack channel. Uh, so it, it took totally two months. Okay. Thank you, thank you. There is a question from uh, Ram. Why use uh, CBRS radio? Is it supported in France? Uh, it was only for testing purposes. We we didn't uh, have you know a uh, full uh, uh, packet uh, uh, you know user packet uh, data. So it's only for a plug and play. Okay. Thank you, thank you, Thurus, for the response. Uh, I know it's uh, there are many questions, but uh, we would like to move to the next round, that is the roundtable. Thank you very much for everyone. Uh, we can't cover all the questions. Uh, so uh, our next uh, agenda is a roundtable. Since our target is to keep uh, overall meeting within an hour, we may not be able to get to everyone. If you still have a question or comment, 
the ether slack will be the best way to get a response from the community to ask a question in the round table or to make a comment please use chat instead of qa please use chat to type in your question i will read the question and unmute you if anyone would like to respond or discuss the comment please raise the hand i will unmute you one by one so you can share your thoughts we will do our best to minimize the crosstalk okay there is a question uh, from viswa uh, i see ether reuses free 5gc but created a config wrapper to make the 5gc configuration in dynamic fashion could you throw some lights on that wrapper what kind of abstractions are available <clears throat> maybe i'll answer this so okay, Ajay, yeah, please we, go ahead. yeah you're right like we have forked the code from free 5gc but and you have uh, absolutely right in terms of finding out that we have done some changes around the config but there are a lot more other changes but let me first uh, tell you what is the config change right so the first aim when what we had when we started doing this private 5g project was that making things a lot more simpler uh, for uh, people who are not aware about this 3GPP terminologies and uh, technologies, right? So our aim was making it very simple APIs to create the slice and add the subscribers into slice and assign some properties to slice or say that some applications can be accessed only by that slice, right? So that was the high level goal. Uh, and the second goal was that for any simple change, we don't definitely want to restart the network function, right? We want to do these things during the runtime. So if you want to update some config, we should be able to do it during the runtime, right? So what we have that we have done the two set of APIs. Uh, one is like a slice level APIs, uh, and the other one is at the device group uh, level APIs. So slice level APIs uh, captures a lot of uh, uh, the most important properties about the slice, like the PLMN and then the uh, MTU and the IP pool and the, um, uh, and the, what are the device group, group it consists of. Right? So, so basically just captures a very basic minimal things. And when you call that API, you can call that API directly from the rock or you can call that API directly on the SD core. If you have some different, uh, let's say you want to develop your own GUI on top of Ether, then you can make use of those SD core APIs directly. So it's not really tied with the uh, only rock, right? So other changes, what we have done over the free file GC is that the QoS change. So making sure that uh, like we have this application level, level QoS and the user level QoS. So making sure that these QoS values flow all the way from the configuration to PCF and PCF to SMF all the way from SMF to Ocean as well. So that was the second change. And then there are a lot more miscellaneous changes. Since we were using Ether for our real testing in the network, we had found a lot more bugs around the, you know, the remote deployment of edges. So when you deploy your edge, which is far from the central control plane, you start seeing a lot of issues on the N4 interface. Right? It, it may include like some of the messages getting missed or some of the messages getting retransmitted or some of the messages uh, don't reach at all, right? So all those errors we handled and then we made the stack a lot more robust. And when you start really using with the real UE, with a lot more UE, then you see the lot of access side issues also, right? So we have one page dedicated for this, like, which talks about what are the minimum changes we have done on the free 5 gc And that, that is like daily, uh, daily we keep doing some of the other thing. And our aim is that to, make things simple for the uh, enterprise yeah yeah that answered my question uh, thank you Ajay. maybe if you could just uh, share the link what you just yeah. described that actually uh, list the, the important changes like i would yeah. like to go through them yeah sure thank you thank you thank you thank you Visa and uh, ajay so next question uh, is for i guess sergey or uh, theodorus is slice project is open to collaborate with new projects to extend its goal. Yes, yes, indeed, it's, it's completely open. Also, because it is a project that is uh, funded under the umbrella of S3, uh, there are very important, uh, let's say, uh, legal framework in order to uh, decide 
for a new partner to join. But that's pretty easy. So uh, they just uh, have to contact me and then we can discuss because I don't want to pollute the channel here. But uh, yes, it's open uh, to uh, any partner in Europe. And we are developing ties with uh, partners uh, across the Atlantic to uh, contribute. OK. Thank you. Thank you very much for the explanation. Uh, is this the answer you are looking for? Hello, everyone. Hello, Serge. Uh, this is Abdul Halim. Uh, I am actually uh, associate researcher at Sorbonne uh, Paris Nord University. So I'm very happy to see uh, this slice project I didn't know before. Um, in fact, yes, this is uh, absolutely a good uh, a good answer. So I will contact you maybe for uh, for a future collaboration. Thank you. Thank you for joining. That's the main. And, and in fact, uh, thank you for activating my my microphone. So as it's active, I'm. Maybe we'll uh, make at oral the next questions that I wrote, uh, the questions and, uh, and response actually uh, place. So in fact, um, can we imagine, uh, as Serge said uh, with his PhD student, so it took him two, three months to get familiar with the whole uh, microservices, uh, let them uh, working together to the, uh, an end-to-end -end example using Ethereum. So can you imagine maybe to make some uh, within the uh, ONF ambassador programs, maybe some workshops or some, some tutorials, but, but practical tutorials to uh, put Acer in the classrooms you know, directly to make some handles with students. And I guess this will increase and accelerate its development process and uh, make it easier uh, even for, re for researchers to build on later and to uh, try to investigate some maybe optimization problems or uh, applying uh, AI techniques to do some uh, resource management, uh, admission control, whatever. I'll, I'll, I'll take that one, Abdul Halim. Um, it is absolutely our objective to, to make the installation and configuration of Ether as simple as possible. Um, particularly for ether in a box when you talk about the class classroom situation you know that should be a matter of minutes to uh to install should be, should install very successfully and, and we'll continue to focus our efforts around simplicity and accuracy as as the configurations get more and more complex um you know again simplification will is, is important but that has to be balanced with the open openness to plug in pieces, as you talk about, to where people want to extend the capabilities. Uh, and that often requires uh, additional configuration that's not in the base system. Um, so it's a balancing act as we get to more complex type of topologies and, uh, and systems. But, you know, absolutely our, one of our key objectives is to make it easily consumed. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ajay and uh, Siva. Thank you very uh, much. I, so let's uh, just go ahead uh, for the next question. Yes, this question is from Pavel, if I'm uh, pronouncing it correctly. I'm sorry if I pronounce it wrongly. Uh, any benchmark based on a UPF based AF packet versus DP, DK versus P4 ETC? Anyone want to respond to that question? Okay, so let me just give some background. So base UPF has two modes, and I think it has some more additional modes like AF packet and DPDK. So in the past, I think I had posted uh, some of the content. Uh, so typically, see, we as an ONF, we don't have the infrastructure to carry out the performance test. We don't have those tools. So we rely on the community member to carry out the test cases. So at least for the base UPF, uh, we uh, have some um, results which were available from the uh, multiple uh, community members. So one is like Intel and others like recently, uh, one of the community members, they had used this AF packet mode and they were able to get into GBs easily. Okay. So, and and uh, as far as I remember with the DPDK and SRIO, we enabled on the base UPF, uh, the performance with certain Intel hardware was like uh, 100 GBPS, right? So of course, uh, the moment we get into the performance, we have a lot more uh, dimens to, uh, dimensions to it, like what kind of hardware, what kind of traffic, and then per it, it really changes for every uh, parameter, right? Uh, and if you compare with the P4, it goes in the terabytes. So it really like you have the 
uh, use case where you need that kind of throughput and you have so many users accessing the data in the GBPS state, right? So yeah, but you can just imagine that it's like a base is like around one tenth of the whatever P4 uh, UPF gives, and AF packet might be a little lower than the DPDK mode. But uh, we encourage if you have some good tools, performance tools available, then just go ahead and do it, and then share the result with us with your settings and what results you uh, achieved. Yeah. Thank you, Ajay. I see there uh, there is a lot of interest in discussing Ether. But due to time constraint, I suggest we can extend a roundtable for another 10 minutes before we conclude. We are recording this meeting, so you will be able to view the discussion later if you need to drop. If you would like to join the Ether Slack channel, then you can continue your discussion there. I will drop, in, uh, drop into chat a link to the Ether community meeting notes, which include the resources such as how to access the Slack channel and many more. So for the next question, uh, Dan uh, is asking the question, is RU, is RU considered as a part of Ether or SDRAN, or particularly there is any reliance on third party RUs? So, okay. So RU is not part of SDRAN. So SDRAN is just, uh, uh, near real time rec implementation and we do have some uh, it can uh, logically it can talk to any um, uh, cu and du and if you see the ru really talks to only cu and du as such right so what it means is that what your uh, what your components you bring it like you bring cu from one company and du from one company so you, you really need to get the RU, which is compatible with that CU and DU, right? So as such, it doesn't have any dependency on the SDRAN project. So what we say from the SDRAN project is that we need to have the ORAN compliant uh, E2 interfaces, which talk to the RIC. Uh, yeah, and that's all is the requirement from the SDRAN project as such. You are, uh, but logically you are uh, free to use any RU, yeah. So uh, to expand on my question, so the open air interface implementations should be considered just for development and testing. Is that correct? Uh, which open air interface you're referring to? I mean, the the OAI based CU and DU. Oh, that one. Uh, that Yeah, I mean, you can take it as a reference. Uh, you can uh, use it and uh, try out it with the SDRAN to see that whatever implementation you are doing is working fine or not. But I think we have used USRP radio for that. Yes. Uh, yeah, but it, it's typically it's a lack of the uh, hardware. That's the reason we have not tried it with any other RU. But if you have it, uh, we, we definitely encourage you to try it out and report the issues. So my question, my answer was in general for the 5G related thing. But yeah, I mean, if you're talking about that, whatever implementation we have extended, then yes, you are encouraged to use the any other RU as well. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. I hope uh, this has uh, answered well. So let's go to the next question, which is related to RU. Uh, asking uh, attendees is Aman Singh. Do we have a list of supported or tested 5G GNBs or ORAN RUs? So we have tested, like from the ONF side, we have tested uh, two. So we have recently tested with the Sericom G node B. Uh, and uh, in the DT trial, we have used the uh, G node Bs, which were radices which came from radices uh, it was um, oran compliant uh, cundu implementation from the radices that we had used but i think what recently i have heard from the some community member that they have used the bias and gnodb as well so since these are like uh, interfaces as standard we may see sub hiccups but but most of the time we are able to resolve them uh, with some configuration changes on either on the core side or on the RAN side, we are able to resolve the issues. Okay, so just to follow up on that, so we are looking at setting up a similar test pad in our lab as well. So do you recommend basically getting a CERCOM 5G G node B and working with the community to for that setup? 
Uh, Siva, you want to answer that? Yeah, certainly. So, um, you know, we ha we have used the CIRCOM um, uh, ourselves, so we do have some experience with it. Uh, but in terms of uh, you know, in terms of broadening the uh, the usage, uh, there may be others that are more applicable or appropriate depending on your geography. Because yeah. the issue the issue tends to be that the radio spectrum is is a national issue, not a not a global uh, globally allocated resource. Right. So you'd have to find you'd have to find radio vendors that are supported in the country in which you're deploying. Yeah, I think yeah. that's okay. right because CERCOM I remember they said that N78 and N48 is what they support. Right. Uh, I'm not sure which band uh, is supported in your country. Yeah. Yeah. So that that that's something that has to be locally decided upon. We can't uh, we can't yeah. do that on a more global basis. Yeah. Yeah. So we are US based, so I think that should be good enough for us. Yeah, if you're if you're US based, that absolutely uh, it does work, and CBRS is available for for you to use. Perfect. Thanks. Thank you, Ajay, Siva, and Aman. Let's go to the another question. What level of day two support available? This question is from Viswa. Uh, for example, growing the uh, coverage area, adding more DNs, etc. Maybe I'm not so familiar with day two support. Maybe uh, this one need to elaborate it. Like what kind of support he's looking for? Uh, is it like code level support or is it like some issues coming out of network and then? Uh, um, I know. So th uh, yeah. this is more more of an operational requirement. Like let's say uh, the ether was started with let's say two radios and. We need to add more radios, or if, if it just started with just a, a single DN with a single UPF, and then you want to add more DNs and UPF dynamically, like is yeah. that is that require a replanning or a restart of either, or that can be done as a day to config? Okay, so adding and removal of the radio is perfectly fine. Uh, you don't need to do um, as such uh, any restart or any redeployment of either. Adding and removal of UPF is also fine. Um, as long as so one of the thing I think which came up from one question I don't remember who had that question was that currently we don't have the way of uh, spinning up the UPF on the fly so we rely on the fact that uh, uh, in a separate uh, uh, operations procedure you go and deploy the UPF get its endpoint and then you configure it in the rock so we have this UPF pooling as a concept but as and since this is a new UPF, you are free to create it wherever you want. Give the endpoint and put it in the raw, and then you can definitely start using that new UPF on the fly. There is no other need. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. It, it is very flexible in that respect. Okay. Thank you, Ajahn. Thank you, Vishwa. So uh, let's go to the another question. Are there any functions included that assist in CBRS plus SAS or 5G, NRU, 6 gigahertz, AFC, auto frequency coordination with providers like federated wireless. This question is asked by Kevin. Um, I'm not sure this question looks very difficult. <laughs> A lot of terminology is used here. So uh, I, I'm not, I have not understood, but what I can say is that in the past when we had deployed the uh, G node bees or E node bees on the not G node bees, I think in the E node bees, we had uh, um, configured the SaaS server for it so that the E node bees registered with the SaaS server, right? So those things we had done in uh, wherever you are deploying it, if the SaaS is mandatory, then it definitely you need to make sure that you buy the radio which is compatible with SaaS specification, right? And it should support. That yeah, but I'm not sure what this whole question is like. Yeah, generally speaking, e ether is is you know I'll say radio agnostic. It, yeah, it doesn't know or or necessarily care what uh, what frequencies or how the frequency coordination is going on on the radio side. Um, it it works through the interfaces into the R R U D U and uh, and the like. At which point, you know, we, we don't we don't have any any view as to what frequencies were used. Right. Okay, so uh, I think we tried to uh, enable uh, Kevin, but I guess they, uh, Kevin is using older version of the Zoom. That's why we can't allow him to talk. But I hope uh, we answered well uh, regarding the 
that. So I think uh, we finished uh, the extra 10 minutes. Thank you for everyone following this meeting. We will send you follow-up email that will include a video recording of this meeting and information on how to access the resources related to Ether. Going forward, the Ether community meeting will take place on a monthly basis. For everyone who has registered to attend this session, we will invite you to join the next Ether community meeting when it is confirmed. Thank you again for joining us today. This meeting has concluded. Thank you. Thank you.